Elsa and Rebecca, come on down! Yay! Oh, wow. ah! oh my god! <laughs> I, I told them not to temple guard me. Oh god. <laughs> Hey guys, my name's Dan, and this reaction comes from Dead Meat. This is VHS 99 2022 kill count. And just two more movies after this one before we are finally done with this entire series. I can only imagine how Chelsea is dealing with this because it's been expressed several times that she doesn't really want to do anymore. Though I know it's more of a joke than anything else, so it'll be interesting to see uh, how she decides to play that off. And the one coming after this one, because I think it's 89 and then the most recent one is called VHS Beyond. I don't know if that's supposed to be the last movie in the franchise. Maybe there will be more. Who knows? Either way, very excited to uh, get into this one to talk about it. And as always, I will uh, be giving you my thoughts at the very end of this video. So please stay tuned for that. But before I do, though, please check all of those links I have for you down in the description below. More specifically, the Dead Meat link if you haven't already. It's a great way to support the entire Dead Meat team. And a great and easy way to support me is to go right below this video and click all those buttons down there. Because I'll also let you see future reactions that I do, but also it's my channel to grow. And without any further ado, let's go. Welcome to the Kill Count, where we tally up the victims hey, of guys. all the horror movies and show you how they were made. I'm James A. Janice. I'm Chelsea Rebecca. And I'm Zoran Y2K Compliant Gavoyage. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> good one. And today we're looking at VHS 99, released in 2022. Following the smash success of VHS 94, a sequel was quickly put together. David Bruckner and Radio Silence returned to produce alongside series creator Brad Miska. They all guided a group of filmmakers entirely new to the franchise, some of whom had already made horror movies we've covered on the channel, while others would go on to create solid contributions to the genre. Their segments mm -hmm. ranged from straight horror comedy to straight up disgusting, uh -huh. often pushing the franchise's already bizarro tone. Producer Josh Goldblum said the goal was to create complete lunacy. I think they succeeded. One oh yeah, they did. The effect to watching a block of Adult Swim. The movie takes place a few years after the last one in 1999. The turn of the millennium was filled with Y2K anxiety, and VHS as a medium was on its way out. These segments vary in how 1999 they feel, but they've all got an unhinged energy that shows the series still has room to grow and explore, for better or worse. How many Y2 kills will be ushered in by this Y2 kills? Millennium? Let's find out and get to them. What, no sponsor bit for this The movie one? begins with a stop-motion military short. At first, it seems like something a child would make, but pretty quickly, you realize how creative and well done it is. I mean, mm -hmm. shit's got a rack focus. It's so good, I almost want to put these four soldiers on the count after they get crushed by a tank, but... Yeah, but I'll never see army guys the same again after watching I'll it. I'll stick to the rules for now, as the segment er, glitches away and channel surfs past the veggie masher from the last film. Wait a minute, what's going on here? What's going on is that this one doesn't have a traditional wraparound, so your services are no longer needed. What do you mean? I mean, I'm doing the first segment. Oh. You need to go! You gotta go! Sorry! No pants! No pants. <laughs> the first <laughs> oh, I forgot about the pants bit. This segment shredding focuses on Rack, but not the usual Racks this series loves to feature. Nope, as this MTV-esque intro reveals, Rack is a teen punk garage band. Its name and acronym of its four members. Le Pop punk uh, music video at its finest. Lead singer Rachel, drummer Anker, and guitarist Chris and Caleb. The party of five minus one has a ah, show party of five. Rack, Aw, part eight? That's the one on the cruise ship, isn't it? Most of their content involves destroying jean jacket alert systems, acting like my kid when I'm in the bathroom, and generally ah. shit-talking each other. That's the closest you'll be to any pussy ever do. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, damn. I get pussy. Well, certainly not getting it on camera like this teenage mutant the ninja, ninja horo get up in her half shell kind of lingus. <laughs> <laughs> Abandoned music venue called the Colony Underground. Three years ago, it was headlined by an all-female punk band called Bitch Cat. They workshopped other names like female dog cat, the uppity kittens, and I'm a bitch, I'm a lover, I'm a child, child and a mother, I'm a mother. Cats. I'm a sinner, I'm a saint, that song. According to their 1995 demo reel, Bitch Cat were your typical counterculture fuck the man types. We weren't made by a corporation. 
We grew our sound and our following grassroots. I don't know what grassroots sound is, but man, I like it. Reminds me of Letters to Cleo or Paramore. Plus, their lead mm. singer is Typey Diskin from Backyard Effects and Fallout Nuka Break. So nice! I'm in. All the music in this segment was written by singer-songwriter Dressage, who wrote this film's score, as well as the banger Perfect Day from Better Call Saul. Oh, that's cool! The cat's rise to fame was cut short by a freak electrical fire that broke out during their performance. In the ensuing chaos, all four members of Bitch Cat were trampled to death by the fleeing crowd, giving new meaning to the group's catchphrase. Play or die! Play or die! I haven't heard that chant since Snake Plissken's basketball game. Rat plans to perform yeah, on the burnt-out stage at the Colony Underground, and Chris even gets Tiffany dolled up for the occasion. Everyone in the band is pumped, well, except for Anker, who's just kind of their punching bag. He's worried about spirits yeah. he learned about growing up. You know these stories, okay? Hindu stories about boots. Boots? Yeah, dead people. Rest of spirits with unfinished business. He says that Buddha, not that one, can take control of humans who cross them. But his friends just deride his beliefs. So that's why you went home and got a baggie of spices? They're like ghost killing spices? Uh, yeah, salt. Haven't you seen Supernatural? They always keep that yeah, dude. in his trunk. After descending into what's left of the music venue, though, Anker's fears are validated. It's, it's not a boo. Eh, sort of anyway. Shredding was written and directed by Maggie Levin, who made the musician-based My Valentine for Hulu's Into the Dark series. She also did that. second unit directing on The Black Phone, directed by her now husband, Scott Derrickson. Oh! oh! And whose son, Dashiell, plays rack member Chris. It's cool. a family affair! Yay! Shredding was influenced by stuff she watched on MTV and VH1 growing up. The dialogue from Bitch Cat's promo was directly inspired by similar videos from the Spice Girls and Annie DeFranco. Other inspirations <laughs> included Hole, Bikini Kill, and L7, who we just saw in Serial mom spitting on a flaming man the kids come across a memorial to bitch cat and immediately start fucking with it literally literally yep. no, then they find the stage so and start the show one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen, 14 15, 15 16. I we normally did four everything seems oh. to be going well <laughs> until they suddenly become the possessed no not that one seems that r c and k have demons oh that was a nice reference i i I know that. It all through him. Whoa, whoa, whoa. No, no, no. It's just a prank at Anker's expense. <laughs> just a prank, bro. My friends fucking suck, dude. Rachel, they sure do. Feels bad about giving Anker so much shit. I'm sorry. No. But that moment of genuine no, humanity doesn't she does last not. long. Why can't you learn how to take a fucking joke, Spice Boy? Fuck you. But with this little yeah, thing Spice I agree. Boy wants, what he really, really wants is to pa pum ah. run out of there. While the rest fill some sex dolls with jello? Just how hard is it to crush four chicks to death? Oh, okay, I guess we're doing like Mythbusters now? Die, bitch! Not particularly. I don't know if I trust the science on this. No, I the don't either. The stomp is interrupted by a menacing mic check. Get out of my fucking stage! Honestly, it's a badass re-entrance for Bitch Cat that mm -hmm. ends with Caleb's K limbs falling from the sky in a Carrie-esque blood dump. Oh, so good. Seems their jello side has awakened the members of Bitch Cat, who return as twitchy zombies straight off the return of the Living Dead poster. They corner Chris in a hallway and give him the Captain Rhodes treatment, tearing away at his tummy tissue. I think. Anyway, honestly, it's pretty dark in here. Yeah. Next up is Anker. Oh, no, 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 no. Why are you still here, man? I thought you ran off. Well, it doesn't matter because Deirdre, the green-haired gem rival misfit, goes after him. But he says, get away from me, you bitch cat! And Spice bays her in the face. And actually forcing works! Forcing to play her own dead note. Unfortunately, he runs out of Spice. <laughs> and this anchor is dropped onto the count. Oh. And is pronounced it for a joke. Bye bye, dude. was played by creature actor Verona Blue, who Levin had in mind when she wrote the script. Blue did her own makeup and provided era-authentic clothing from her own wardrobe. And her melting ghost head was achieved by outfitting a mask with tubes filled with baking soda and oh, vinegar. Oh, that's mm, so a cool! A-plus science fair project, but an A-plus kill. Rachel yes. is left as the last one on the rack. So she runs around some annoyingly dark footage until she's finally torn apart off screen with each piece just kind of, you know, tossed it away. Yeah. Yep, there's another. And, that's uh, a cap. Yeah, that's there a cap. you go, you got it. Mm -hmm. And then all the king's bitches and all the king's cats tried to put this Humpty Punkteen back together again. <laughs> oh, the the Humpty takes us back to the stage, where the members of Rack have been Frankenstein back together. These rancid rag dolls were made using full-body casts of the actors. They were put together by Patrick McGee, who previously created Ratma and the Beast for VHS Ratma! 94. The tape ends as our meaty marionettes FNAF their way through one final song. We then cut back to the Saving Plastic Ryan section. Ha! I knew there was a rap rap. And check it out. Now we got motherfucking dinosaurs. Then we wait. Go go to the next segment. Ha! Yeah. Told ya. Whatever. I'll, I'll do the next one. Cool. I'll just be here. Ah, <laughs> just chilling. Got it. 
This one oh, is no, it's Orin! It and follows college freshman Lily as she rushes the top sorority on her campus. It's a competitive process, but she thinks she has a better chance than her roommate Helen. You mean you really think they'll say yes to people like us? No. Not us. She decides to make a suicide bid, meaning she won't apply to any other sororities. It's high risk, high reward, and seems to pay off, since we cut to Lily letting loose with a group of sisters. Seems. Imogen, Lucy, Hannah, and their leader Annie. Ooh. Annie kind of got a Parvati vibe. There's also a camera girl named Lindsay whom we never see or hear, but she's there, I swear. Hey, Lindsay. See, I'm not lying. The Black yep. Widow Brigade gets Lily wasted and leads her into the campus mausoleum. Are these tall girls working for the tall man? They tell Lily an urban legend about a freshman named Guillotine who rushed their sorority 20 years ago. She was desperate and alone, just like you. Wow, these are just the meanest of mean girls. Sure As part are. of the hazing ritual, Guillotine was buried alive in a coffin, but her sisters forgot to dig her back up. Probably too much burden. When they finally came back ah. a week later, the coffin was empty. Some say she just crawled right through into the underworld. And if you listen closely, sometimes you can hear a knocking sound. The sisters offered Lily a place in their sorority. And how right would they eventually be? We will find out. But only if she pulls a guillotine and spends the night six feet under. Man, you'd think people in this franchise would know not to fuck with any chicks named Lily. She's given a camera True. to record her experience, as well as a special box of courage. Only open it when you're your most scared and about to pull the cord. It'll give you strength. With that, I Lily promise. into the dirt. At least the coffin has a little glass window she can see out of. That's not, oh, oh nope. never mind. Suicide Bid was written and directed by British filmmaker Johannes Roberts, whose work we've seen on the channel with The Strangers Pray at Night. His other films include 47 Meters Down and its sequel, and the latest Resident Evil movie, Welcome to Raccoon oh, City. Oh, dope. Lily seems like she's doing okay at first, and pumps herself up by shit-talking her roommate. I'm not like you. Helen's gonna watch this later and be like, why are you so obsessed with me? 15 minutes in though, <laughs> Lily gets nervous when she hears scratches and thuds. It's the plastics, of course, playing into the guillotine legend. Mm -hmm. It causes Lily to open her box of courage, only to find it full of spiders that start Spiders! Over her. Big spiders. props to actress Ali Ionitis, who was lying in an actual coffin with actual spiders mm. crawling on her actual face. Mm. They filmed this segment in a real cemetery in Pasadena with a grave dug by a SAG registered funeral director. For some scenes, Ionitis was set down there with the camera and just kind of had to figure out what to do with it. Lily yanks on a rope tied to a bell and begs the sisters to let her out. But they're too busy dancing in the rainstorm that just broke out. Campus security rolls up nearby, and the girls don't want to risk getting expelled. They knock down the bell and scatter, saying they'll come back later to let Lily out. Lily has a moment of reflection and records another message for her roommate, Helen. If you ever see this, I just want you to know that I'm really sorry. You're my best friend. Helen's all like, um, we were assigned roommates and met last week. The rain starts <laughs> filling in the rest of the hole, causing Lily's coffin to get creaky and leaky. Sounding like the Titanic in this bitch. <laughs> It's actually legit horrifying. And yes, it is. When an undead guillotine presses her face against the lid window. She eventually breaks through and gets all up in Lily's face like a deadite as the camera shorts out. Yeah, I, I have w w one of the many fears that I have is drowning and... That was certainly hard to watch. The guillotine mask was also created by Patrick McGee, who used small pull cables to control its facial movements. The next cool. morning, the sisters return to find the waterlogged grave. Are you fucking filming right now? Ha! <laughs> Classic Lindsay. Yeah. <laughs> I should probably delete that footage though. Imogen swims down to rescue Lily, but finds that the coffin is empty. Unable to explain what happened, the girls agree to take the incident to their graves. That happens faster than expected. Sounds like I know how you what you did last summer. The, 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 the exact plot. Since one week later, they're all waking up in their own coffins with their own cameras. Uh, except for Lindsay. She gets a pass, I guess. Annie is confronted by an undead Lily. Payback's a bitch! Who their souls to Guillotine in exchange for her own. I made a deal with Guillotine that if she let me go, I'd give her as many sisters as she could possibly want. Wow, never seen such an articulate zombie before. Oh, mm -hmm. wait, the, the half corpse in return. She was. Ah, uh, yes. Quiet. The tape ends with the four girls trapped underground to die. Future Bye. members of Team Guilty. We briefly cut back to the stop motion interlude where the army guys fight a rat monster. Maybe as a nod to Rabba. It's pretty cool. But that's all we've got for the interlude, so on to the next segment. Chelsea Rebecca, come on down! Yay! Yay! Ah! Oh my god! <laughs> Guard me. Oh, <laughs> is called Ozzy's Dungeon. It begins with an episode of a children's game show with the same name. It's an homage to obstacle course driven Nickelodeon shows sure. like Double Dare, Guts, and Nick Arcade. But it mainly reminds me of yeah, Legends same. of the Hidden Temple. Mm -hmm. From its outfits to its showcasing of kids just like you. Any hidden talents out there I should know about? I 
personally always rooted for the Red Jaguars, by the way, and I still feel very strongly about this. In place of right. Kirk Fogg, Fair we've enough. got Stephen Ogg as the unnamed host, accompanied by some in living color style fly girls. Wow, baby Billy took Bible bonkers in a new direction. Actually, he's giving me Willem Dafoe and Wild at Heart, but with his gums put back in the right place. The kid <laughs> contestants have to compete in the Clash of Eggs and the Face Splat, all under the watchful eye of the host and his muscle mommy sidekick. If they win, they'll get to enter Ozzy's dungeon, where the unseen Ozzy will make their wildest dreams come true. The only catch sure. is that literally no one has gotten to the end yet. Not surprising, since this show is wildly unsafe. During uh -huh. the first dungeon crawl, one contestant eats shit so bad she has to get taken out on a stretcher. Damn, sucks to suck. You don't want to uh -huh. get dumped on, fool. Good thing they've got highly trained EMTs. This entire thing is so spot on to me for two crucial reasons. One, it understands how fixated 90s Nickelodeon was with goop and slop and uh -huh. mess. And two, it also understands how fucking terrifying Legends of the Hidden Temple actually was. Yes! On this show, if a temple guard caught you, you were violently pulled into whatever was behind the temple. My imagination went crazy with this as a kid. Oh and my! I have a feeling the same fear of the unseen side of the temple. And also considering the fact that at this time they were doing also like horror shows. So Are You Afraid of the Dark was on there. And I was a huge fan of that. So that would sometimes leak into all of this. Are You Afraid of the Dark was actually that and Goosebumps. That was my first like real introduction to horror. So I have a lot to thank Nickelodeon for. But, you know, imagining what the hell happened to them here. Your brain just kind of just goes. Inspired this segment. Ozzy's Dungeon was directed and co-written by Flying Lotus, a musician and music producer who made his first foray into feature filmmaking with 2017's Kuso. I'm a long time Flying Lotus fan and I was lucky enough to see him live back in 2010 at the Ann Arbor Film Festival. Nice! He scored the 1962 animated film Heaven and Earth Magic live. It's one of my all-time favorite film experiences and it's been so cool as a fan to watch his artistic journey since. Since That's Flying fun. Lotus go on Dead Meat Podcast. The second oh. challenge sees <laughs> contestants catching saucy turkey legs in their mouths. This is like an early survivor challenge that gets retired because someone fractured their orbital bone. By the end of it, there are only two kids left. Timmy from Los Angeles and Donna, and I'm from Detroit, Michigan. I like to think Flying Lotus chose Detroit because he cited one of its greatest exports, Jay Dilla, as a massive inspiration for his music. Oh, and the host stiffs Donna for a high five. Damn. Oh man, at least let her show you where she's from. Anyway, the two of them are entering the final challenge, an obstacle course based on Ozzy's digestive system. We're gonna crawl on our hands and knees through the large intestine and then out through the poop, shoot, escape road. <laughs> Uh, but he poops from there. Well, not right now he doesn't. Nope. Donna gets an early lead, which upsets the host so much he starts shit-talking this other kid. Timmy is not very good at all. One of these nope. very go- Gotta dig deep, Timmy! Too bad an obstacle oopsie causes Donna's leg to- Oh, holy shit, just fucking- Oh god, crap. Yeah, crap. oh! Yep, sure, let's show it again. If you look closely, you can actually pinpoint the exact moment her leg breaks in two. Turns out this is a tape being played in Donna's family's basement. Mm -hmm. They've kidnapped the host as revenge for Donna's debilitating injury. We signed mm -hmm. a waiver. Oh shit, a waiver? Yeah, you are bad, you can go. But really, you think that's gonna work on this snot-rocketing woman who's so mad her shirt's coming off? This is Donna's mom, Deborah, played by the late Sonia Eddy, who won a posthumous Aww. daytime Emmy for her work on General Hospital. Nice. I've seen her on the kill count in Leprechaun Back to the Hood. She also apparently played the witch in Into the Woods on Broadway at one point, which, if anyone has footage of this, I'll get you a Dreamcast. Didn't I tell oh, you I'd get you a Dreamcast? I can use a Dreamcast. You told you to do? Deborah is pissed because she hoped the game show would be their family's ticket out of this dump. Last episode, I said the malicious attic was the stankiest location in all of VHS, but nope. this one has it beat. Like, I don't uh -huh. see any cats, but this is the kind of basement that has an overflowing litter box shoved under a bowflex. Uh -huh. uh, maybe that smell is just Donna's literal stanky leg, all gangrene from her injury. Eh, at least she's a goth queen. The family subjects sure the is. host to homebrewed versions of his TV games. The first challenge is honestly only slightly more dangerous than the original. Then instead of turkey legs, he's forced to catch raw
raw chicken cutlets, likely dripping in wishbone. Just get it all up in this pie hole! I'm adding a trigger warning here specifically for John Taffer. How dare you pick up water! Oh. <laughs> Final challenge, they've recreated Ozzy's obstacle course. Only this one is a little more detailed. Ugh. The brown stuff. Ugh. Don't ask questions you don't want to know the answer to. I if the won't. The can't beat the buzzer. He'll get a face full of this spicy Mountain Dew. Talk about live wire. In the mm -hmm. movie's nastiest scene, we watch this guy slip and slide his way through the putrid play place. Zord Ugh. and I argued over who got to do this segment, and wow, I think we both forgot about how much poop there is. There is a Despite lot. Despite a valiant effort, the host loses by a couple of seconds, earning him a flesh-melting flu shot. Before they inject him, though, he offers them a deal. In exchange for his life, he'll take them to Ozzy so Donna can have her wish granted. Damn, he caved fast. This lady would have found Bin Laden the next day. They agree, and everyone bundles into the van for a family trip. <laughs> Dads, do be listening to Detroit's home for smooth jazz, V98.7. Oh, yeah. Warm. While the show itself has since been canceled, the mythical Ozzy remains in the studio under heavy guard. Deborah recaps what they're all going to wish for. New car. Yeah. Ten. Fifteen million dollars. Okay. Fifteen million dollars. Ma'am, this is Nickelodeon. Best we can do is a trip to space camp. Yep, ben Lotus pretty took a much. Lot of inspiration from his own family and created Deborah as a horror villain version of his own mom. The host sneaks them in backstage and leads them into the actual Ozzy's dungeon. Wait, Muscle Mommy? What do you do? Do you live back here? What is your life Could like? Could be. Lying on a slab at the heart of the dungeon is an overgrown Ozzy. Donna steps forward to make her wish, but it's not to make her family rich and famous. Amongst all the poop and stuff, this segment has real commentary about kids being exploited for entertainment and personal gain. Mm -hmm. Deborah's been giving hardcore showbiz parent vibes. Don't nobody want to see that on the big screen. And apparently Donna's sick of it, since whatever she says causes Ozzy to split open and reveal his true form. He looks like Delia Dietz's sculpture brought to life, again. Ozzy fires a ray of light that melts the faces of the host, Deborah, and her father. Host went through all of this to avoid getting his face melted, only to get his face, face melted. melted. The tape ends on a freeze frame of Donna looking awfully satisfied. Mm -hmm. Love you, sweetie. Okay, this was fun and all, but oh, I've got a game show to win. Hunt, you know those are all rigged, right? Why don't you believe them? We ever so briefly <laughs> return to the army men, who are all of a sudden smooching. What the fuck are you doing, loser? Hey. Hey, is that my camera? Don't trip over my loot. Turns out these interludes were a backdoor entrance into our next segment called The Gawkers. The retro red versus blue show is the creation of Brady, who's been using his older brother Dylan's camera. Dylan's friend group consists of Kurt, Mark, and friggin' Boner. Yeah, dude calls himself Boner. Rocking those Scotty Too Hotty sunglasses, too. Ah! Being bored dumb suburban boys with a video camera, they get into all sorts of idiot antics. I am embarrassed by how much I relate. Okay, what do you want for lunch? Hot Pockets. Oh. It's a direct hit. When they're <laughs> I bet. The woods, they're talking about Y2K. I think the world ending is more likely than you getting laid, bro. Since plenty of you were now born after Y2K, I'll explain. It was a legitimate concern that computers would malfunction in the new millennium. Since True. They'd get confused by the year 2000 and think it was 1900. Ultimately, it ended up being fine, but that's only due to the tireless work of countless programmers who made software and hardware Y2K compliant. I salute them. The group yeah, loses their idiotic charm when they start trying to sneak upskirt videos of random girls. The pubescent criminality doesn't stop there either. Nope. They start creeping on Dylan's sunbathing neighbor Sandra, who just moved in across the street. Thing is, she seems to be making it easy for them. He mentions that she's out there washing the car in Daisy Dukes every damn day. Maybe it's a Greek thing. At least I think she's Greek, given all those statues in her yard. And she's always making Saganaki. Opa! Oh! Oh! When they see Sandra get a delivery from a dorky dude who thinks he has a chance. It's a brand new computer, and she hires none other than boy pup Brady to help her set it up. Brady's the constant butt of his brother's jokes, but his new gig finally makes him one of the boys. He's got more game than his big bro. <laughs> Yo, shut the fuck up! 
Uh, almost. The Gawkers was directed by Tyler McIntyre, who co-wrote the script with frequent collaborator Chris Lee Hill. The two also created the teen slasher Tragedy Girls and have story credits on Five Nights at Freddy's. Last year, McIntyre directed Michael Kennedy's script, It's a Wonderful Night. He had his lead actor Luke Mullen do a lot of the filming himself with an era-appropriate camcorder. They went through a couple of cameras trying to get the right look, ultimately landing on the Sony Handycam Hi8. Dylan and his friends convinced Brady to install spyware on Sandra's webcam. He successfully pulls Mistake. it off, earning him beer and approval. It shows how this kind of behavior can be reinforced and promoted. He was a kid five minutes ago. This gentleman is a man. <laughs> Brady starts to feel guilty when things start getting real. Of course he does. Just feel like a creep. Dude, we're just having some fun. I know, it's just... She trusted me, man. Just shut it off. We will, we will. They will not. This nope. segment was inspired by the suburban people watching of American Beauty and sex comedies like American Pie, specifically the parts that haven't aged well, according to McIntyre and Hill. They wanted to explore the perils of unchecked horny teen behavior and mentioned Woodstock 99. Despite the subject matter, they aimed for a less intense segment to be a palate cleanser in this otherwise grody film. <laughs> the rest of the boys sit back and watch the show, but this peep show turns creep show when Sandra pulls off a wig and starts growing snakes out of her head. And what the because fuck? Turns out Medusa. this girl's a full-on gold. Gorgon, like Medusa, and that snake skin they found earlier was shed by her. The Medusa makeup was another one done by Patrick McGee, who applied the snake skin through giant prosate transfers. He admits the effect was probably too subtle for the VHS quality video. Looks like Sandra knows they're watching her, which is exactly what she's wanted this whole time. Mm -hmm. She leaps across the cul-de-sac and into Dylan's bedroom, where she promptly starts tearing Mark a new one. Uh, maybe more than one. Kurt tries yep. to intervene, but is knocked back by a backhand? Hmm, she didn't get all of it. But we never see him again, so I guess I'll add him to the count. Sure, Damn, why you know not? that about to be on the next Botch of Mania. Uh -huh. Dylan escapes and runs into Brady just as Boner is tackled and killed as well. The brothers flee as Boner's decapitated headstone is thrown after them. Brady tries to apologize, but Sandra doesn't accept it and turns him into a statue. She then turns her stony gaze to Dylan, dooming him to spend the rest of his life as a tripod. I'm back and I want a new car! Woo! Really? Yeah! Oh, cool. Uh, we hardly ever leave the house, though. Do you want to test drive it or not? Yeah, I'll take it for a spin. Okay, that sounds fun. The camera blue screens into the fifth and final kind of segment car? to hell and back. It begins on New Year's Eve, 1999. Videographers Nate and Troy have been hired for an unusual job. They're here to film a ritual being conducted by a coven of witches. These hex girls worship a demon named Ukuban and plan to give him a physical form inside this woman named Kirsten. I volunteered to be the vessel because I've always felt like I was destined for something bigger than me. The ceremony must be conducted near midnight, which just makes me think about time zones and how demons are seemingly affected by them. You can't explain that. Nate and Troy think nope. this is all bullshit, but hey, job's a job. The summoning begins with your usual hand waving and chanting. Very good, very synchronized. Pretty soon, Troy gets jump scared by a figure behind the TV. The witches identify him as Fergus, a demon they just seem kind of annoyed by, like he's someone's weird kid who keeps getting out of bed and sneaking downstairs. They yep. work to banish him, but before he leaves, Fergus manages to grab a hold of Nate and Troy. The two find themselves in a red-tinted, rocky new world. Oh great, Troy, we're on the plateau of Gorgoroth. Between a prop comedy-sized ah. bear trap and a bare-butted demon boy, they start to figure they're not in Kansas anymore. No, they're, they're not. Troy panics and tries to shut off his camera light like he turned it on at a movie theater. And when it comes back on, it reveals three bloody bodies. They're impaled on what I assume is this guy's toothpick. I love this <laughs> big Chernabog guy. This version of hell is so chaotic, we don't know if he's a devil or the devil or something. Something else You're not entirely. supposed to. While running around, the guys encounter their first friendly face here. A scrabbly, scabby woman who confirms their situation. Oh, thou art fresh. What great sin does thou commit? Oh no, it's like when you make eye contact with a renaissance fair worker who's a little too into it. This oh, dull God. sounding beauty is Mabel. And in this house, we are big, big fans of Mabel. Fresh souls taste Melanie Snow I can see why. really goes for it here. Mabel was very much that, where I was like, oh, I'm getting permission to be like a total freak right now. <laughs> Mabel's familiar with Ukaban, who she says lives nearby. Stupid fat Ukaban. Nate reasons <laughs> that since they rode a demon into hell, which is fucking awesome, they can just ride Ukaban back out when the witches summon him. Mabel agrees to lead them to him under one condition. I return thee to earth, while thou write my name in the great book of the witches. Yeah, sure. 
Yeah, right, well, yeah. Miss Mabel, yep. Miss Goldbite. <laughs> Homie Simpson, smiling politely. They only have eight <laughs> minutes before midnight, though, and I don't think Hell has TSA pre-check, so they'd better get a move on. Mm -hmm. To Hell and Back was directed by Vanessa Winter, who co-wrote and co-produced it with her husband, Joseph Winter. We love a husband and wife horror team. Yay! Folks. Joseph stars as Troy and brings a lot of levity to the role. Hey, Mabel. Can you go to hell for an isolated shoplifting incident? He also brings a lot of screaming. <laughs> That's a sound you'll be very familiar with if you've seen Deadstream, which came out the same year as VHS 99. The duo oh. created that prime rib nominated film using a lot of the same cast and crew as this second. Oh, look at Ellen that! Stone appeared in it as Chrissy, while Nate's actor Archelaus Crisanto was its first AD. They filmed most of this hellscape in Fantasy Canyon, Utah. I love how different it oh. feels from the other segments, thanks to them leaning into the rocky landscape. Yeah, the they really did. The itself was pretty small, with only a few side valleys, so they relied on framing and blocking to make it seem vast and endless. The journey to Ukuban is fraught with dangers big and small, like this blooming onion of a bear trap. I almost <laughs> stepped right into the huge trap. <laughs> Wait for it. Ah! Ah, so trap! Nate and Troy catch up to Mabel. She's pulling a quick snack off this spit roasted campfire corpse. They run into more hell spawn, like this faceless Latin chanter and a half woman, half maggot voiced by Vanessa Winter. This creature, referred to as the Wormaid, was designed by Troy Larson, inspired by the half animal, half people demons in Hieronymus Bosch paintings. She was physically portrayed by stunt performer Ariel Winter. In order to portray the Wormaid, Winter had to have her arms uncomfortably taped to her sides. Check it out. Reverse worm. <laughs> oh, look at that. <laughs> That's fun. A ton of fun, practical creatures who were designed to reflect Hell's social structure. Kudos to the performers wearing heavy makeup in the middle of the desert. Yeah, They're seriously, though. To shoot in front of a green screen. Mabel fends off the Wormaid with that roasted arm she pulled off, then announces they've arrived at Ukaban's back door. Never trust a weird little guy, though. They will bring you to a giant spider lair. They mm -hmm. crawl their way past the webs out of the orifice and passed some more tortured souls. Shout out to Cage on Head Lady. This feels like one of those old school circles of hell for moneylenders and flatterers. Troy oh, arms yeah. himself with a very tiny trident before the group reaches Ukaban himself. They're attacked by the demon's robed followers who look like they'd be bad guys in TMNT. When Nate gets mm -hmm. overwhelmed, he tells his friend to go on without him. Instead, Troy uses his giant salad fork to stab one cultist in the neck before nutshotting another and slashing him to the ground. The beefiest Slipknot member nearly ah, Slipknot. before Nate intervenes and stabs him to death off screen with his trident. Very spurdy. While they tried to do all the blood effects practically, a few didn't work on set. So they were augmented with VFX in post by Radio Silent and VHS 94 alum Justin Martinez. Mabel tries good job. to join the boys, but she gets skewered at the last minute by another demon. With her dying breath, she reminds them to write her name in the witch's book. With the new year upon them, Troy and Nate take a running leap and get into Ukaban's belly. Troy makes it back in one piece, but Nate's been reborn in a different way. We made it! <laughs> oh, wait, 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 my tether! Enraged that their ritual's gone awry, the witches stab Nate to death while he's stuck in Kirsten's body. Uh, I think that this is technically two kills. Double kill? Troy tries to crawl away, but he's sliced up by a scythe. As the coven argues with each other, the dying Troy uses his blood to write Mabel's name in their book of power. Imagine escaping from literal hell just to get murdered in a Girl Scout leader's basement. Yep. Not be me. The feed briefly flashes back to a petrified Dylan and Brady. The movie ends as Dylan's camera battery dies. Over the end credits, the cultists can be heard chanting a new name. Mabel. 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 Implying our favorite character might be reborn. How many Yay. people were Y2 not okay after our latest visceral VHS viewing? Let's find out and get to the numbers. Uh, I, I found another murder case. No. No, all right? Ever since I no. became a parent, I don't want to watch my loved ones get killed on tapes anymore. I True. must be weird or something. This is sick, 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 and we're done. Okay, well, that's probably for the best because this one has your name on it. So. Okay, well, that's oh. what I said we are definitely watching this. Oh, sure. Now you want to watch it. Oh, okay. So what's going to happen to Zora? Hey, I got my old camcorder to work. How are my boys doing today? 
Well, I mean, I'm fine, but I'm pretty sure our baby's drunk. <laughs> so are the, our baby's not drunk. Oh, well, if you're not drunk now, you better be soon, because the Wonka Kill Count's gonna bring down the whole channel, and I need a new job. Oh, is that bad? Oh, yeah, it's worse than Critters 4. <laughs> oh, no! Go lower than that. Thanks for that, honey. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen these labels that they put on things now? Which ones? The one that shows a little silhouette of a baby here getting a suffocation risk. I mean, come on, seriously. It's gonna be pretty dumb to file your baby in a Tupperware container. Right, Phoenix? Oh, no! No! Oh, no! Oh, no! Oh, no! Oh, no! Get out of there! Oh, Zorin! Oh, holy shit, is this thing possessed? Yes. Zorin, what did you do? Yes. What? I bought it open box and the condition said good, fair, or possessed. Why did you pick possess? It saved us 42 cents. Okay, so 42 cents? Right, okay. Oh. Come on, Zorin. James A. Jean needs to hold apology conference while in Wonka kill count controversy. Zorin, did you see this? No, I didn't see this. I don't care what's happening with James. Take our baby. Oh, no. What? Because the dino's still inside. I am not going back into that thing for a dino. This baby will not sleep again. Oh God, no, right? Zorin! Stay no! Back. Stay back, it's okay, it's okay. Daddy's got this. No, Zorin, Zorin, no. No, Zorin! Uh. Open it up and... Ah! Oh! I got this. Yeah, you totally got this. Zorin? Zorin? Uh oh. Oh god. Oh god. Oh no. Well, Phoenix, looks like neither of us are going to be sleeping tonight. You're right, I shouldn't be so cavalier about your dad dying. No, you shut it! I wonder if I can salvage the flannel. <laughs> oh, well, that was fun. Want to get to the numbers? Mm-hmm. So All right, Zorin. Do you acknowledge that we just watched me die? Yes. Guys. I will. I'm still alive. How am I still alive? You will be dead soon, I guess. The I don't know. 33 kills in VHS 99, with 18 male victims, 14 female victims, and that one campfire corpse cooked beyond recognition. That gives us this nearly even Y2 pie chart. Sorry if you prefer a Y2 cake. VHS 99 ah! is towards the bottom of the franchise in terms of quantity of kills, but it makes up for it in quality. Here's how sure the kills broke down per segment. Much more even distribution this time around. With a runtime of 109 minutes, VHS 99 had a kill on average every 3.3 minutes. And with five segments, the movie had an average of 6.6 .6 kills per segment. We'll give the Golden Chainsaw for coolest the number kills for the host and Deborah's family. This whole segment was a wild ride, and Ozzy's weird fucking laser face was an extra ounce of what the fuckery. Plus, uh -huh. we all know we love to see face melts in a VHS movie. The almost for lamest kill will go to Kurt, since he just kind of disappeared. Maybe he snuck away to play Tomb Raider. And that's it. Good thing. VHS 99 was released in 2022 and broke Shudder's viewership record previously set by 94. We quickly cranked out another sequel, VHS 85, as a bookend to this mini trilogy. We'll look at that next week after another Sunday refresher. But until then, I'm James A. Janice. I'm Chelsea Rebecca. And I'm a man who was punched in the nuts for turning the power off at his friend's Y2K party. <laughs> Oh, God. And this has been the Kill Count. On the next Kill Count. Oh, boy. It's time for another Kill Count. Nice. And this one's a doozy. Steamboat Willie entered the public domain this year, which means cash grabs are coming to ruin it's like Winnie the Pooh. Childhood. Hey. It's not a bad tactic. But this ain't the modern Mickey Mouse. This fucking guy. It's 1920s Mickey. Which means they can't have Pluto, a colorful outfit, or his trademark voice and giggle. Ha <laughs> ha! Wait, no, hold on! Yikes. The mouse trap follows in the footsteps of Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey, and the Meat. Okay, it is. Alright. It's a lot, lot worse. Did oh no. No, and we don't want to. Watch a guy dressed like Mickey Mouse for some reason. Kill some people in an arcade for some reason. I'm way too high for this. I'm way too high for this. Yeah? Well, I'm not high enough to enjoy this thing. It's got Ugh. bad kills, bad acting, and a batshit amount of padding. Oh, well, we no. Oh, thank God. It's just pretty gosh darn bad. Oh, you bet your fucking ass it is. And you want well, me to watch this? Or don't. <laughs>
I don't really care. Some friend you are. James, what are you doing to me? Sunday, only on dead meat. He better be worth it. He totally won't be. The mouse trap. I, I don't want to watch that, but I. How else am I gonna know what's going on unless I watch it? I don't like willingly watching bad things when I know they're gonna be bad things. Ah. Oh. Well, at least this movie wasn't bad. I thoroughly enjoyed the hell out of it. All the transitions felt really natural. It felt like I was literally watching a VHS tape because back in the day, we used to record a whole bunch of different stuff on the same tape. So that that's kind of what it felt like for me. And I love the fact that everyone had a good reason to hold the camera. That is always super important, as we've seen with a certain VHS movie that happened prior to this. Well, not, not 94, but you know what I mean. Um, but I, I do love the fact that there was a lot of revenge going on within this uh, movie from, from scene to scene that there was always somebody being uh, just, just so mean to somebody else and then them dying from it. But unfortunately, the people who were good, they also ended up dying. So I guess uh, not every death is equal, but um, those deaths, I, I really hoped that they weren't going to die, but... You know, it, it's all a part of the movie, so I, I can't really fault it too much. And it, it, it did make sense. I also love the fact of all the brutal kills that were in there from start to finish. And that, that was really fun. Of course, unfortunately, that one who died to Medusa with just like a little like backhand that didn't even look like it connected at the time. I, I was kind of wondering what happened because I think I turned my head away for a moment to just, just you know, just, just, to, just to do that, just look behind me. And then, like, oh, he just fell down. So I was assuming something happened to him. So I had to rewind a little bit and be like, oh, he... Oh. So I literally turned my head away for one second, and then I missed whatever that was. I'm still not sure if it truly was even a kill, but we didn't see him for the rest of the, of the movie, so I guess that makes sense. Um, it was a pretty uh, wild video mixtape of a whole bunch of different horror-related things. And I'm I'm curious to see where the direction of this franchise goes. Will we see another one of these types of movies in the next one? Or are we going to see something completely different? Is it going to be great? Is it going to be bad? Fortunately, we don't really know about that yet. I'm going to have to watch, apparently, this uh, train wreck of a, a movie from what I, I can tell from what he said. And you guys know I am not looking forward to that. But that will do it for me here. Comment down below. Let me know what did you think about VHS 99. Please leave a like if you enjoyed. Please check all those links I have for you down in the description below. Then lastly and most importantly, I'm going to give a huge shout out to my $5 and up supporters on Patreon. Cruising, Wolverine 310, Kester Cronus, Raymond Bright, Joshi, Chris Curtis, Anne Perry, Bossacophony, Misa, Misa 2, Lily the Stoopy Fan, Lauren, Jenny the Swifty, Flea Street Vicomp, Emily the Flower Lover, Steffi, Sophie the Sunset Girl, Summer the Dog Lover, Misa 3, Arrow Hamster, Inca Linquis, Aubrey the Charlie Brown Lover, ZK Stir, Thomas Shawanowit, Carter Rezik, and Havante Jones. And if you too like to have a shout out and in each and every one of my videos, please head over to patreon.com slash for more. And I will see you guys next time.